tell me more about the, 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 the two guys that we love so very much. You've done, I know, re- reading the book, you have done so much research on the book, but yet you and, and uh, Don Knotts were really kind of related through marriage. That's right. Um, yeah, I, when I met Sophie, who's now my wife, and that was in the 80s, uh, I found out, you know, a short while later that her older sister was, was, was dating Don, and then they married, and he became my brother-in-law. <laughs> so we spent a lot of time together at family gatherings and family vacations. Well, you write in the book about the friendship that he had with Andy and how genuine, and it came across that way on the screen, but he was also, a, a, the part he played as Barney, kind of like uh, paranoid a little bit and uh, hypochondriac, and in real life, he was, was, he, was he a hypo in real life? Well, there's some similarities, you know, between all of Don's characters and the real guy. You mm-hmm. know, the nervous man was the core of all of these, all of these characters, and, and, and Don dreamed him up. Uh, in the in the in the fifties, it came to him in a dream, literally. And obviously, there's some there's some real Don behind that because he was a, a a fretful person. He would he would get into a tizzy before he went on live television. He'd you know lock himself in his room and fear he was going he was getting sick and he'd go over his lines five thousand times. And uh, it's it surprised me because he's such a talent. He was such a talented guy. Why would this guy be insecure? Why do you suppose? Why do you suppose we we loved him when we smiled every time we saw him or even heard his name mentioned? Yeah, we, he, he he was a a great um, just a great comedic actor. Uh, Billy Bob Thornton told me that Don's his his favorite mm. uh, comedic actor of of all of them, and I think he's underappreciated in that sort of pantheon. If mm-hmm. I can use a big word there, it's uh, I I just <laughs> I'm not a TV writer. I, I don't. I don't really understand the industry very well, but I sure feel like Don is one in this line of great, great, great comedic actors, and that's why that's that's why so many people. We would go to Disney. We went to Disney World with him once, and like people of every single generation were hailing him. You know, uh, it really it really bowled me over. The old, older people. This was in the early nineties. Say, hey, look, it's the Steve Allen guy. You know, the man on the street. Man on the street. And, <laughs> like are you nervous? No, part. no. Are you nervous? No, no, no I'm not nervous. <laughs> me nervous? No. Nope. No, me nervous? No. And I still remember the lines, Dan. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this is great. Folks, we're talking with Dan DeVise. He's written a book, uh, Andy and Don, all about the show and everything about the show. Let's talk about Andy because Andy was a guy, and I love that in your book, and he came across as being a nice guy, which he is, but also uh, Andy could carry a grudge. Tell us about the time when some folks from his hometown here in North Carolina went up to see him on Broadway and what happened. Yeah, well, I think that it, it came across over and over again that when that he really rewarded loyalty and the people who'd stuck with him, he, he rewarded them again and again. He had all these people back on Matlock like 30 years later, who'd mm-hmm. been on the Griffith show, including Don. But I, I gather, because I, I heard this, people told me this over and over, that he, if he felt like people had betrayed him, sort of left his side, um, you know, especially in time of need, he, 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 he did hurt him. Um, El- Eleanor Donahue told me that. Um, she was on the show for a year, and, and she left. But the chemistry board. didn't click. The chemistry did not click with it her. And I, I thought on screen it looked okay. I know it. No, they look awkward. Don't they look kind of awkward? Uh, I think they look awkward. Maybe it's just I'm reading that in because I talked to her. But she left, and then he she saw him at a party later, and he was very kind to her. But then he just sort of she said, and then he just turned around, and I was dismissed, and that was it. Well, let's talk about uh, Miss Crump because that sure didn't uh, that didn't uh, didn't go away. That thing was pretty hot and heavy. Talk about Miss Crump. Well, they found they found the chemistry with that with that character. <laughs> yeah, on the set and off, right? I guess so, and um, I, I I didn't know anything about that. I didn't um, either. I didn't read her. I never remember reading anything about their little love affair. I don't think there was anything written about it. Um, I, then I started hearing it first as rumor and then as, as fact, and the next thing I knew, everybody I was interviewing was talking about it. I, mean, I guess it was, a, it was a very well-kept secret, but everybody, I guess, around the production knew they were a couple in, in real life and apparently a very... Um, I mean, it was a real, real relationship, an important relationship, I think, to each of them, and that's why it's it's in there. It's, I think it was really an important thing in Andy's life. Is she still alive? Uh, no, no, she 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 died quite a while back. I interviewed some of her kin, though, and they were very kind and, and really opened up. I, I try to present her in the book. You know Mary Tyler Moore, kind of like, like almost like a feminist. Oh, beautiful, yeah, yeah. Character, she mm-hmm. lived alone, 
on, in the show, I mean, away from her parents, independent woman, and she was in charge of that relationship with Sheriff Taylor, you know, which is pretty cool. And she came across that way, I think, on the air, too, as a very independent woman. But both, the real yeah, person yeah, and exactly. the character. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Uh, yeah. Let's talk about Aunt B because did Aunt B have some? I know towards the end she had some mental problems and Francis Bavier and did uh, did cast members find her a little bit odd or hard to get along with? I've got a big piece that's going to run in the Siler City newspaper that kind of it's kind of adapted from the book and it's all about her. Um, so, but but it's all in the book, so you're not going to miss it. Um, I don't think there was any real depth to any sort of hostility between Aunt B and anyone else, but I do think that there was a chill. And my best understanding is that Andy ran this production as like a big celebration. Mm -hmm. And they were always singing and dancing and harmonizing and, you know, and just telling off-color jokes and throwing film canisters around and just having a really good time. And I, I think that maybe Francis Bavier was more of a, professional and maybe a little more serious and maybe didn't see herself at, as very comfortable in that setting. And I know she didn't like when people cussed. I think she once hit uh, George Lindsay over the head with an umbrella. You hit Goober? Yeah. She hit Goober over the head with an umbrella? I think she did. I'm not, I, 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 think she, I think it was he. <laughs> yeah. And, but at the end, I guess they, they made, she and Andy made up, I guess, uh, late in her life. And th I don't think there was ever any real substance to it. I think there was just kind of this, this chill between them. <laughs> For a long time. How do some of these characters develop? Like Floyd. We all love Floyd. Funny Floyd. How, how did his character come about? Well, if you watch the pilot, uh, the episode of the Danny Thomas show, right. almost nobody's in there except for, I guess, Andy and Opie, right? right. Um, and, and, and over the... Well, it, I, by the second episode of the Griffith show, which is the Manhunt episode, by then, Andy, had, Andy the boss, had decided... Don's going to be the funny guy. I'm going to be the straight guy. And that set the template for the rest of the show, which is from now on, we're going to insert one character after another, and Andy's going to interact with all of them, and he's going to react to all of them, and Andy's going to be the surrogate for the audience and kind of just enjoy this, these performances by all these goofballs. Mm, boy. And, and Andy was this wonderful straight man, a wonderful reactive comedic actor. And so that's where you get Floyd, I think, and where you get later, you know, Howard... Jack Dodson, you know, Hal Smith, <laughs> Jim Neighbor, let's not forget him. You know, there are all these goofballs kind of revolving around Andy. No, because that's when we first heard Jim Neighbor sing, wasn't it, on the show? And everybody said, is that fake? And we realized what a beautiful voice he had. He, 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 had, that, he had done that act at a, a nightclub, a kind of an insider's nightclub in Santa Monica where, where, where people in the business went. Mm. And, and I... I, I heard this story 20 different ways, but Andy somehow went in there and saw him and said, oh, my gosh, this guy's amazing. He was kind of a, a natural because he, Andy and Don had both worked for years to get as famous as they got. But, but, but Jim Neighbors just walked, waltzed onto the set. It's kind of amazing. What made him decide to, the character of Otis? We, everybody loved Otis, never saw him. Well, we saw him sober a couple of times. We didn't, know he, we didn't know he drank and was a drunk until we saw him sober one show. It, I That's guess funny. that was kind of an... an anachronistic <laughs> thing because you wouldn't have like Arthur that kind of character on TV now it would seem kind of distasteful right 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 um, and in the return to Mayberry he's like an ice cream guy and I think he's sobered up um, but yeah there was a there was a drunk guy I think in the pilot even so they knew they wanted to have a the kind of character who was locked up every day in the jail cell um, but 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 it wasn't initially that 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 actor uh, uh, Hal Smith I am pretty sure. So Hal Smith, yeah, he just, he, th all these people, apparently, even Don, started out where they might have been one-off, like, come on and do an episode, and we'll yeah. see what happens. And then uh, Hal Smith did such a good job that right when it was done, um, Aaron Rubin, the producer, said, hey, I think you just talked yourself into a part here. Hey, tell us about the part where Opie was throwing the rock at the beginning of the show, and we know that it's like 10 seconds before the rock hit the water, and what they had, what they had to do to make it look real. I think they call that a continuity error. I don't entirely know what that term means, but basically he couldn't he, he couldn't get it in the water. He didn't throw hard enough. He was five or six years old, and I heard, heard this from the assistant director Bruce Pilson. And so finally, they had a member of the crew loft of, of a rock r right when Obi throws it. And so if you watch closely, I think it's the first season. You can tell there's kind of this gravity defying lapse between when Obi throws it and when it lands. Dan, we were also shocked when Andy died because we didn't know he was sick. They really kept that very private, the family, didn't they? Yeah, I, 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 I had a, 
and as, as you say, I worked really, really, really hard on the research for this book. I, I probably did twice as much as I should have. It shows. But I, thank you. But I had a, a, a hard time with with the la- latter chapter of Andy's Andy's life. Um, I think that his circle of friends and acquaintances narrowed quite a bit to where a lot of them were people who just interacted with with Andy as sort of tradespeople, people who maybe had built his house or. Or just you know, or, or or were doing work there. He had a really, I think, a, a smaller circle. He wasn't getting around probably as much, and so it was it was it was distinctive. Though I I would find all these dear friends of his, but one after another, they tell me they hadn't talked to him in a long time. Wow. At the end, so it was I had a hard time kind of teasing out those those final years of of his of his life. But yeah, I I I, I think that it was a silent heart attack that he suffered. I'm mm. pretty sure. Um, but yeah, they, well, of course he lived. He lived to be a ripe old age. So um, yeah. You know, hey, uh, he and his wife, his first wife, adopted two children. One boy tragically died, an alcoholic, and his uh, second adopted child, a daughter, Dixie. She's still alive, right? D- Dixie's still alive. Yeah, yeah. I, I think she was even in in Mount Airy recently for the Mayberry Days. Um, mm-hmm. And I interviewed her. She was a lovely woman. I, I it was a delight to talk to her, and she loved the fact. I remember this. She loved the fact that I was writing about this friendship mm. because just bringing it out and celebrating it because it was so important. I think it was kind of the key to the show. You know, these two friends were at the heart of it. And the, it's it's they who walk off together at the end of Return to Mayberry. You know, they're the friends. That's It's really their show, I think. Oh, that's great. The, the book is extraordinarily good, Dan. It's well written. And I can tell, like you said, you did so much research and if uh, some folks are listening right now and want to get a copy of the book, please tell them what they need to do. Oh, gosh. Well, if, if you know, you can go Google Andy Don book, and you'll, you'll find it all sorts of different places. There's a lot of great, great bookstores in North Carolina that I've, I've visited some of them in the recent days. It's just tremendous. Uh, and, I, gosh, I'm going to be a bunch of different places around the state. Um, I'm, I'm going to be speaking at UNC today. Tonight I'm going to be in Walkertown. I'm coming back to the state uh, after Thanksgiving. Um, I've got a website, DanielDivizet.com, but I, that's kind of a weird name. I don't know if you'll find it. That's okay. Well, listen, hey, continued success. It, you did an extraordinary job on this, and I, I think I speak for everybody that's read the book. It, you can't put it down. You, you love every bit, everything you covered in detail. Hey, one question about Thelma Lou. How's she doing? I know she's still alive, old Thelma Lou. Yeah, I interviewed her a couple of times. She was dear friends with them both, um, and 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 with Don especially. I know they hung out together a lot. Mm. And yeah, she's 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 still alive, still doing great. She's still interacting with the fan base. I think she lives in Mount Airy or near there, and and does regular stuff there. So if anybody's ever in Mount Airy to visit, um, there's a decent chance you can build a trip around seeing her. I think somebody uh, somebody told me she's just as sweet off the uh, off camera as she was on camera. Oh my goodness! Yes, and, uh, but that, 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 that's she's not the only one. I mean, Ron Howard, what a nice guy he yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. Hey, it was just a it was a, cl- a classic. Uh, it was the perfect storm of comedy, if you if we could say that. That's a good line. The perfect storm of comedy. Yeah. When all these characters came together, they got along, they blended, and gave us such wonderful, wonderful entertainment. Who we all smile when we think of Don and Andy. Yeah, I sure do. Well, Dan, thank you so much for for your time this morning. Continued success, my friend. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. All right, Dan. Thank you, folks. Dan DeVise, talking about his book. It is great. If you love the show, we still look at reruns. We still like it. We still laugh. We still smile. It's great.